Uh, great to see you after only sh eight short months since we released Houdini 20. It sounds a little crazy. It feels like we've just had our own Olympic Games, but somehow we made it here in one piece. And uh, that's all thanks to the amazing R&D team we have and everybody at Side Effects who supported us. So uh, you'd be right to think that putting out a release that resonates with the user community is primarily an exercise in good software development, right? I think we, we agree on that. But before we, you could talk about software development, um, you talk about an experience that we have internally listening to you. So it is very much an exercise in good, constant listening. And that's something that we do rigorously at Side Effects. So why am I saying this to you? Because sometimes we are able to respond to you in a day, overnight builds. Sometimes it's one death cycle. Sometimes it's several. And even if you don't hear from us right away, those ideas are germinating. And what makes this release 20.5 special above and beyond, I think all of our releases in the past, is this the size of this, what should we call it, a uh, listening chamber. The size of the listening chamber and the ideas, the significance of the ideas that have been germinating in it, some of them for years. Again, why am I saying this? Why, why this intro? Why are we not jumping straight into the features? We will in a second, but it's something important I want to announce. You've been waiting for a long time for something to happen, and it's happening today. Uh, one of those big ideas has germinated and today is bearing fruit. And that thing is COPS. So, welcome to COPS. All right. It's not COPS 2.0. It's COPS 3.0. That's part of history of side effects. We won't go into that. Nevertheless... Image processing, completely reinvented, redesigned a complete new approach to image processing founded on the principle of 2D and 3D working together seamlessly to give you the best of both worlds. This is not a system where we design a 2D image processor and then somehow shoehorn 3D into it. This is built with 3D flowing freely into 2D and back in mind. This is the philosophy behind Houdini always, and this is the latest instantiation of that philosophy in, 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 in COPS. And I should call it Copernicus because it is Project Copernicus, a bit of a play on words there, spelling it with a C, C O P. Uh, we tried to keep it secret for a while, didn't work out. Everybody knew what this was about. Nevertheless, we're happy that it's here. What else? Um, performance. One of the big things that we focused on starting on Copernicus was performance. So we're looking for an all-out, real-time, near real-time, when possible performance. Uh, and that comes from two sources. One, we've written the whole thing in OpenCL. So you've got instant, immediate, 100% GPU performance acceleration. And the second thing is Apex. Apex, which stands for all-purpose execution graphs. It's an engine that we introduced in Houdini 20. Uh, as it applied to rigging and animation, well, right away, we may, we're making use of it for Copernicus. It's running under the hood. You're not interacting with it directly, but it gives you a lot of optimization, a lot of power, and uh, that, combined with GPU, uh, really sets it apart from everything else. So what is Copernicus today? I, I will start by saying what it is not today. Copernicus is not a compositing package yet. As strange as it may sound, that's a lot of work. We've planted the seeds. It will happen over the next couple of releases. But what it is today, it is a powerful foundation. It is a powerful tool set for procedural texture synthesis. It is a powerful foundation for image-based machine learning. It is a, a strong interop with a platform with anything that supports open effects. Um, it is a great just chest tool chest for anyone doing VFX and wanting to play in 2D and 3D at the same time. Scott will tell you a lot more. I don't want to steal all his thunder, though I may have stolen about half, but uh, there's lots that you'll hear from him uh, in, in a couple of minutes. Um, one more thing at the high level, what is Copernicus? Um, this to speak to the view that we have towards helping you as a community. Um, Copernicus is one of those final posts along the path 
that we've been building to connect the dots on the CG pipeline so that you have a choice to stay with Houdini and all the work that you do. Uh, I don't know that we're there yet. We're still doing a lot of work to get there. Um, but this is our vision. And I think for the first time now in a while, uh, you're able to share that with us. We're able to share it with you so that we all see the same thing. We all sort of go in the same direction. All right, so that's uh, Copernicus. I, I, didn't, I did mention their uh, machine learning. So let me, let me tell you a little bit about where we are there because everybody is curious about you know, our plans for machine learning uh, as a company. Um, we're taking it very seriously. We're continuing in a very cool-headed kind of way. Uh, we watch the hype. We don't take part in the hype. Uh, we like new tools. Um, and we, sorry, we like new toys, but we're not building toys. We're building real tools here. And we understand that in this community of ours, uh, having that uh, undiminished control over, the, over, the, over your results, the art directability of the work you do is quintessential. And ML is not quite there yet to give us that. So at least for now, ML will grow foundationally in Houdini. It will coexist, however, with, with proceduralism. It will not replace it. And we will build it in layers. So we started in Houdini 20 with adding the Onyx. If you recall, we added the Onyx uh, inference node so that you have native access to running ML models in Houdini. We've expanded that, Copernicus being one of those places. Um, now in Houdini 20.5, we're adding the next layer of that foundation, and that's building native nodes in Houdini SOPs and TOPS to do the ML training. And then after that, or in parallel, as it may be, we are going to start building solutions, actual solutions to real problems. So that's, that's the staggered way in which we're going, and it's a very calculated and cool-headed way. So please stay with us. We'll have lots of good news in, in the future about how ML can be leveraged in Houdini. So let's put that aside and talk about the rest of this release. It's actually a very big release. It started as a quality of life release, you know, short eight months. What can you do in eight months? Can you do more than just a couple of things? But we, okay, so it is a lot more, but we started with it as a quality of life release. And that's what it is in many ways. It was intended as a quick follow-up from the big apex news in Houdini 20, rigging and animation. Um, we got we got your feedback very quickly. We focused in this release, as you'll hear from Esther and Warren, very much on making things easier and more complete. So performance, usability, functionality uh, across the board. And we'll, we'll continue as well from there. Um, Solaris, uh, which is, I'm really happy to say, is, is, is uh, experiencing a very nice adoption uh, pace right now. It's going wide and it's going fast. Um, it's also a quality of life uh, release for Solaris. And it's about getting you to cross that threshold of USD more easily, less painfully. Uh, we know it takes time. We need to build software. We need to build learning materials. You know, Chris and others are here to, to tell you about what we're doing there. Um, but I think we're getting close. We're starting to build these high-level tools that... Um, hide, if you will, some of the complexities, but not hide them to the point where you'll get jump into Solaris and then not understand it. We always we always put that at the forefront, the, you know, the ability to get you to learn and understand, not just learn to repeat something, because that way, you know, you won't be able to take advantage of Houdini the way we've envisioned it and the way that it can be taken advantage of to deliver the work that you do. Uh, and then join at the hip, to Solaris, of course, is Karma, and especially the XPU is seeing some really nice performance boosts. So our colleague Rob PK will be here to talk about both Solaris and Karma. And we have lots of other gems, um, small gems maybe, or big, depending on where you're sitting and, and what you've been waiting for. Uh, my point is not to go through everything here. Uh, my point is to tell you that we're listening. So let's begin. And let's begin with dynamics, shall we? Um, this is where our core lives. This is where our core rebalances itself. Um, it's, it's the place we call home. And we have a very exciting piece of news for you for Houdini 20.5. Um, we've added a new multi-solver. Uh, you'll hear lots from Scott. I won't 
I promise God not to steal any more of that thunder. I'll just say that this type of solver is meant to complement the existing ones, not replace them. It is something that deals with granular materials really well. Uh, and if I tell you the name, it's MPM material uh, point method. You might go, oh, but we've heard about this before. Isn't that the very, very slow type of solver? You get really great stuff right off the bat. The math is great for it, but it's really slow. Okay, don't believe that when it comes to Houdini. The approach that we've taken is very much infused with our thinking. It is very much taken advantage of all the highly optimized physical simulation data structures in Houdini. And like Copernicus, it's all written in OpenCL, so it's immediately taken advantage, full advantage of the GPU. So it's actually very fast for what it does. And if you don't believe me, Scott will prove it. Let's welcome Scott. Okay, thank you, Kristen. So yeah, let's let's jump right into this before he reveals too many more things. Uh, so uh, probably the most well-known sort of example of an NPM solver usually deals with snow. So we've got Craig here bursting out of this snowbank just to show what we can do with that. It's a really nice example here. Um, and as Kristen said, you know, the NPM solver is something that whose goal is to sort of recreate physical um, structures. So different types of material. Snow is one of them, but there are many other ones. So let's take a look at a quick setup here. So uh, if you're familiar with our uh, SOP-based flip solver, we've sort of emulated a similar setup for the NPM solver. So you set up your sources, your collisions, and so on, you know, in their own sort of nodes that then all plug into the solver itself. So in this case, we have this rock collider and we have our uh, our flip here as uh, as the input. And we're going to basically use one of our preset material models um, to turn them into particles uh, and, uh, you know, simulate this as kind of a, um, let's say, a, a granular sort of approach here. So we're going to walk through a quick setup uh, and then uh, go ahead and hit play. And this video is sped up slightly, but you can see that we are caching this live. So this is more or less the performance that you're getting out of this NPM solver. Then we'll quickly change our material preset to this Jello preset. And now we get this totally different result. So again, the goal here is to create like a bunch of different types of materials and then simulate them in as, as realistic way uh, as possible. Um, but again, as was mentioned, it is sort of a multi-physics solver. So these things interact with each other. It's not just a either or. So, you know, in this example, we have sort of mud, rocks, fluids, all in a single simulation. So there's no caching of one thing and then re-simulating. It all happens in the same space which of course gives you this really nice interaction where the mud and the water and the rocks all um, play off each other to give you this really sort of believable interaction between all these things. So here's a slightly more complicated setup uh, as an example here, again, kind of emulating what we just saw in that final render. And, you know, it's in a lot of ways, typical sort of Houdini work of setting up volume sources um, setting up your containers and so on. But it's very familiar to anybody who's used to our other tools. Uh, now, this actually is cached out here. Um, but if we go ahead and use this uh, recipe, so this is an included example in Houdini. You see it puts down this entire network. And now you can see it's simulating sort of in real time the way it actually would as you're caching it out live. So again, being on the GPU makes this very fast, very uh, quick to set up and use. Um, and then our recipe system, which is how we're placing down these nodes here at the end of this video, um, lets you create more complex setups really quickly without necessarily having to build your own shelf tools and so on. We don't have too much time to talk about recipes here in this presentation, uh, but there's going to be some information in the Hive uh, more. So just another example here of the, the benefit of NPM as, a, as this multi-solver. So we have the flip toys here moving through water and sand and then getting that mixture of water and sand together into sort of a mud slash wet sand kind of approach here. Um, and this uh, really opens up a lot of possibilities for simulations where, you know, oftentimes you'd have to juggle multiple solvers and make sure everything is talking to each other in a clean way. This simplifies that process um, greatly. Um, so what about sort of, in some ways, not, not necessarily your typical um, simulation uh, where you have more custom forces, which is very common, obviously, in visual effects where you want to do something sort of implausible. 
uh, like this entire town being destroyed by this uh, uh, vortex here. So again, let's just quickly walk through um, how this is going to work from a network point of view. So, you know, we essentially have some SOP geometry here of this uh, uh, geometry with some uh, attributes on it to talk about velocity, normals, all the standard stuff that you might do um, in a Houdini setup. And then in this dive target, you have access to any custom forces that you want to build. So the SOP level solver is sort of a fixed thing, but inside of it, uh, there is this dive target that lets you do things like this, um, set up uh, custom forces to tear this town apart. And in this case, we're using a sort of a concrete preset to turn these uh, buildings into essentially you know, rigid materials. But again, uh, a fast setup, relatively simple networks, and a lot of flexibility. Um, what's really nice about this is that, you know, you're basically setting up these material properties. So it is a bit of a different uh, mindset when you're, when you're building these simulations. Because all the fracturing, all the stuff that's happening here, where normally you might imagine like cutting up the building into pieces and all that kind of thing, kind of just happens automatically with NPM. You kind of just say, this is concrete, and then it behaves more or less the way concrete does. So um, it gives you this very believable result without having to do a lot of hand-holding to, to uh, make sure it fractures in the way you'd expect. In theory, it fractures the way concrete would actually fracture. So here's just a bit of a closer up view of just so, just so you can see how the concrete breaks apart into big chunks, but almost becomes sand at certain points. So it, it goes through these phases where it's more rigid and then eventually into tiny, tiny uh, pieces, which again is really nice because it just sort of comes along with how this solver behaves uh, on its own. Um, and that means that you can also have sort of different types of materials all together. So, you know, in this case, we have this sort of fruit being smashed and it has this almost cloth-like skin on the outside that sort of tears and ripples, whereas the inside is this more chunky, smushy stuff in this, you know, mystery red fruit, whatever this actually is. So it breaks apart in a believable way, still maintaining those material properties, which is really important to things like this. Um, and you have the sort of spectrum of things from, you know, basically fluid water um, all the way up to very hard things like concrete or metal. Um, and again, the nice thing about this sort of setup is that once you've set up these material properties, they kind of just behave the way those materials do. So metal bends and buckles in ways that you would expect. And that becomes really important when you have more complex setups like this, where this um, uh, telescope is being sort of torn, uh, satellite is being torn apart by some sort of internal forces. And whereas, you know, in other solvers, you might uh, have to do a lot of work to cut this up and make sure that, you know, the metal pieces are bending and deforming and plastic uh, deformation, all those kinds of things. But all of that just sort of happens in the NPM solver. You know, the the bending and shearing that you're seeing on those panels is just because we've said that it is metal. And so as the simulation progresses, it bends and it does the plastic hardening over time, all the stuff you would think metal should do, but all sort of handle on the solver um, side of things. So again, opening up a lot of freedom to the artist to just build things the way it would in reality and then see how the simulation reacts. Um, and of course, you can do all sorts of things from very believable, realistic things like the satellite destruction here or this almost uh, ship in a bottle done by one of our QA folks uh, just has this sand almost as a sand fluid hybrid, which is a, a really fun, interesting effect. Um, um, and these materials sort of um, interact with themselves in interesting ways. So we showed you snow earlier. But here's an example where the, the plow is not just moving the snow out of the way, it's compressing it, right? So as it sits in one state and then gets interacted with, it becomes compressed and it sticks together more than it did when it was just loose on the ground. So you see this change in behavior as the plow pushes it into these chunks, which then break apart over time, which is a really complex series uh, chain of events, but again, all handled really nicely uh, inside the solver. So, you know, we're showing you some larger scale things like this plow, but it works all the way down to these small scale things. And again, because it's this believable um, uh, physical reality underlying the solver here, you can get, again, very believable results really close up. So you have sort of your big effects -y scenes all the way down to your small commercial or motion graphics -y type scenes as well. So, of course, we have to have some massive thing emerging from ground if this, we're going to talk about visual effects. This 
kind of scene shows up a lot. So once again, I think what we're really just trying to show here is how these things change over the course of the simulation from compacted together to breaking apart to eventually almost becoming a grain simulation on um, parts of this mesh. So you have this um, constant changing of state as the, as the fracturing and breaking happens. Um, and now almost into a semi almost magical effect with these, uh, you know, snow material exploding in slow motion here. Um, and again, really just trying to show how this solver works for different materials, different scales, sort of anything that you might want to try, it kind of works, which is really nice because sometimes it's difficult to really change scale with a solver like this, but the MPM solver handles it, um, really well. And just to sort of drive that point home, we're going to the opposite end now of this sort of large scale. Uh, avalanche effect. Um, and again, you see the really nice uh, ability of the snow to almost behave like a rigid body at the beginning of the simulation, then breaking apart. And by the time it's halfway down the mountain, it's almost become powder. So it's a really nice transition that feels, you know, extremely natural the way you expect something like this to break apart. So uh, we talked about NPM, but we've also made some improvements to the vellum solver. So we had this uh, version of the Vellum Solver that was sort of interactive and you could brush it and so on. And some of that technology now has made it into the base solver itself, along with SDF collisions uh, that really speed up the results, especially for certain types of simulation like fluids and grain. So here's just an example um, of something being run through the Vellum Solver and giving you this really nice liquid um, effect. So look for some nice speed improvements uh, for certain scenarios in the Vellum Solver. So uh, in Houdini 20, we had an example file of a uh, RBD car rig. Um, and now we've made it actually in a node in Houdini. So the car rig exists in Houdini. And you can do standard setups like following path to drive the car along this path, along with uh, having a drive over the ground, or of course, uh, crash into another car. So right now, the, uh, the car rig does not have this uh, destruction aspect built into it, but uh, stay tuned. Things things are going to evolve over time, but for the moment, it does not. It has follow path and a lot of other really interesting built-in effects. Uh, one of them that's really nice is this, uh, the car rig uh, that will uh, react to the, the ground that it's driving on. So you can see as the car drops down, we're actually running basically a bullet simulation on the car, but also the suspension and the tires. And so what you get is this really nice bending, bouncing effect. And you can actually see the tires sort of bulging out there. And that's actually using another new solver that we've got in 20.5 that we'll talk about in a minute. But you can see how the, the tires bend under the, the force of the car as it lands. And to go along with this rig is a nice interactive state for setting up some of these effects on, say, the suspension and the wheels. And you can see you've got interactive handles in the view for in, in the viewport for setting up the area of influence for how the suspension will react to the physics and bend uh, rather than sort of stiffly, rigidly moves. And here we're just going to look at the result of that. And you can see the bouncing, the, the way the, the suspension moves along with uh, the body as it hits. Uh, in this case, it's a height field collider. Um, and now just again, a close up underneath there so you can see how it all reacts together. So all of these things, you know, slowly build up to give you this very realistic uh, motion of a, of a believable car. Um, so I mentioned a new solver uh, for the wheels, and that is something that we're called the wrinkle solver. Um, so here we've got this uh, early R&D test where basically we're taking, um, you know, a, a base simulation, in this case, just like a soft body simulation, and then we're doing this wrinkle pass on top of it. And this wrinkle solver is very, very fast. Um, it's sort of a very simplified cloth solver. So it's really meant for sort of a post effect. So in this case, you can do your bulk motion uh, uh, in a simulation like this and get your results very quickly. Maybe you don't have to worry about getting such a high resolution because you're not worried about the wrinkles. And then you do the wrinkles as a sort of a secondary pass. And it is very specific to wrinkles. Um, but it's key to understand that it is very fast. It's, it's meant to be interactive speed. So here we have this apex rig with the wrinkle deformer embedded into the rig itself. So this is not a post-process that happens. It's part of the rig. 
Um, and so you can see that as the animator moves this control around, you get the wrinkles happening on the shirt in, in basically real time. Um, and the idea here is that the animator gets a, a result as they're working. Um, and it might even be the final result. This may be how the animation is, is finished, or maybe it's just be something to guide the animator as they're working. And maybe a character effects artist is going to replace it with a full cloth sim down the road. But it gives you a really nice feeling of what's happening as you're working, really trying to make this, uh, you know, a fully interactive experience. And here now just running through the animation so you can see uh, the stability of this uh, simulation, even though it does run in real time, how fast it updates and gives you nice stable results. So Kristen mentioned ML and a suite of tools to help you with your training data. So we showed a demo um, in the 20 release uh, of a capybara being deformed using ML, and we provided example files so that you could try it out yourself. Well, again, a lot of these tools now have been put inside Houdini. Um, but just to be clear, not the deformer part of this. There is a suite of SOP tools that work on uh, generating your training examples and also uh, associating those samples together. So you can build your own training networks now using native SOP tools as well as a top tool that lets you, you know, put it up on your render farm uh, in order to get, uh, you know, results like this. So on the left, we just have our standard sort of... Uh, rig uh, captured and weighted and on the right we have the uh, ml deformation um, and so what's really nice about the result that we're getting here is not only that you get things like volume preservation because we're running a soft body um, simulation to achieve this but also this really nice sort of non-linear feedback that when the arm bends it's not just blending in another shape it's progressively blending in over time so you're getting lots of small shapes along the way which is really nice and suddenly makes it have a really natural looking um, effect. So we're really looking forward to building onto this ourselves, um, but also putting these tools out there so that you can train your own models um, to do things along these lines. And so now I'm going to bring up uh, Rob Stoffer to the stage. He's going to introduce our next uh, area to discuss. So thank you very much. Thank you, Scott. Um, so, wow, so far, lots of great things that uh, I know you guys are enjoying so far. I know a lot of people have been asking for the NPM solver for years, and probably as long as I've been at Side Effects, so 10 or 11 years now. So it's great to see it in there. And we're not done yet. Um, we're really just getting started. Uh, we're driving for, you know, incredible performance. It's all written in OpenCL, hardware accelerated. It's already in SOPs, you know, as we've been converting a lot of the dynamic tools into SOPs over the years. This is already starting out in SOPs out of the gate. We'll be working on more material presets and things like that. It's really not your grandfather's NPM. Um, and going forward with Dynamics, we're going to keep pushing as we always do, adding things like sparse volume solvers for pyro and smoke with GPU acceleration and boosts in performance for, for you know, near real-time performance. Um, and with machine learning, where we also are going to continue developing those tools, um, complex muscle systems, out-of-the-box muscle rigs with uh, machine learning deformation built in um, for real-time performance, and we're exploring specific ML solutions for um, dynamics and things like that. So um, now we're going to move on to character. Um, you know, you saw all the amazing tools that we created in Houdini 20 with Apex rigging and some of the character workflows. We made loads of improvements um, on those tools, um, and before Warren and Esther come up to talk about them, I want to share with you a short film made by our friends Chris Rutledge and Tumblehead. And so we'll start there. Dang it. Uh, this is your captain speaking. Just wanted to flag that uh, we may be experiencing some turbulence shortly. Uh, we'll do our best to keep it down to a minimum, but we would appreciate uh, everyone keeping their seatbelts fastened at this time. And uh, we thank you in advance for your cooperation. Oh, thank you. Sorry about that. Thank you. Oh, so sorry. Uh, is this normal? Oh yeah, this is totally normal. Uh, are you sure? H how do you know that? Yeah, so basically my uncle, who's like this super experienced pilot, told me that the chances of a turbulence-related accident, it's actually crazy rare. 
it's all about like aerodynamics and thermodynamics and 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 even with turbulence like this like it's probably really really unlikely that the plane would crash yeah So now that we've been hopefully all made very curious and very excited about new options and all those crazy things that we can do to bring those characters to life, let's dive right into it and see what we have in pedal for you. So with 20.5, you will be able to set up a whole range of characters. We have your bipeds, quadrupeds, you see a bird, and if you look closely, there was even a small eight-legged creature there that we can all now set up. And it's important for us that you get to animation more quickly, but yet that we still have the flexibility to find the solutions that you need if you really want to find something custom. Here we have Electra, fully built with pre-shipped auto rig components. And when we look at that example, we see outside all our auto rig components, each of them representing one specific thing that we add to our rig. So yellow is always IK, lose always fk we see it on the controls and then everything and we are just layering this on top to get it to our rig all in stops what we can also see is that skeleton we call it a guide skeleton it's just not just any skeleton we put some additional stuff on it and what we're putting on it is tags you all know tags from so many applications we use it everywhere to have a bunch of words assigned to a given thing and then later we filter like crazy after it and be incredibly flexible. And that flexibility is something that we're now transferring to our rigs to make them truly procedural. So here is the interface of one of our component scripts. First thing that you want to do is, of course, you want to know what you want to do with it. So you choose up here the functionality or the, the component, that's what we're calling it, that you want to have. And you see we have a lot more to offer there for you. So we have now FBI, okay, map constraints, reverse feed, and many, many more for you to explore. And we are actively working on adding even a lot more for you to play with. So, so that list will continue to grow. On the other side, we have those tags and you will find them all over the place in our components. And we have our skeleton. And those tags are in a way our communication unit to prepare your skeleton with like just a few names on it beforehand, and they tell the rig what to build where. So let's see one of those examples, first of all, in action, what it means. So we start with our tech skeleton, set up a bunch of tags, and now we're layering on our components. So we see in the blue box, something starts to move, and we are adding now stuff. We are adding more controls, we're adding now a spline, we're adding IK, and you see you have one node for IK, and it's apparently doing it for everything in one go. So just a few nodes, character is fully rigged, ready for you to use. So how does the IK now, now actually know where, where to apply itself? How does that work? That brings us to Atrip Adjust Array, our new node. You just select a few nodes, call them spine, and now I want to apply the spine functionality. I select the spine functionality, and I tap in spine. Boom, that's all I had to do to get the spline working with my auto rig component. We continue with that. We set up a left arm and a right arm, really just typing in the name. That's all I do. Now I select IK in my auto rig component. Boom, there I am. And I'm telling it just where, wherever you find an arm, please build IK. And the system is smart enough to understand that you do have a left and a right arm and it will build one for each of those ones. Now we have these four characters and they couldn't be more different. I mean, we are having here a bird that obviously needs something for the feathers. We have bipeds, quadrupeds, we have capybara that has hair and we have an elephant that has a trunk and a tail and a lot of other things. But they also share a lot of stuff if we think about body parts. So all of them have a spine. So what do we do? We tag the spine on all of them. Great, so we can apply the same stuff to them. Well, all of them have legs. Even if they have a different number, the functionality is still the same. So what can we do? We tag them. So you can see the green parts again. Those are our legs. And we can transfer that idea pretty much to any body part, anything on our rig, allowing a truly flexible setup. So that setup here is really, first of all, that switch here, that's live. It is really that fast to switch out your character. And 
those pink nodes up there, that's where I just set up my tags. And the tags tell our setup there, our colorful setups, exactly where to do what. So that's just our little communication unit. So you just apply a few tags and you get a completely different character out of it, still working with the same thing. Really great in terms of like configuring that thing now. If you realize, ooh, okay, maybe I need to tweak something on the settings, you just need to do it once and not four times and uh, iterate over nodes. Now that we know the advantages of, uh, of that combination, we can, of course, also transfer it to systems that are not just like the typical characters that we know, but also to mechanical structures such as the steam engine. And we're actually starting with the same idea. So you might see those are very light colored joints here and tags again. So we're preparing our character or, or machine and we do exactly the same. We're using our auto rig components because they're very generic. So you, we just create a few controls. We apply a look at functionality for our pistons. And now we're getting to a point where it's actually very interesting because those upper and lower gearings have like a very specific functionality that is very clearly not just a simple IK. I need to do something very specific to get that logic working. And you can actually see it here even a bit clearer if you look at the heart of it. Isn't it wonderful? So you see that collision up there happening. And that is, of course, a very specific motion. That is not just IK. So what do we do? How do we solve this? Or what other cases do we even have having a similar problem? Here we have our little eight-legged friend. And of course, nobody wants to animate all those eight legs over the terrain. So you want to have a helper functionality for your animator to, well, you still want to use get the legs first of all set up, but you do want to add something specific extra to help you a little bit. Something custom, very much designed for your spider. So remember, with Houdini 20, we introduced the concept that you could build your own component scripts with nodes. With 20.5, we have something else in Petto, and we can come now to this. So having a look at our spider, we start with everything that we've already seen. We start with tags, and we get the IK pretty much out of the box from this. Great. Eight legs, all set up. Great. But if I now move my main control, yeah, of course, the spider isn't moving, right? So we want to find a solution for that. And first of all, look at those ramps. They define the animation curve. What I need to do now is to know, uh, tell each leg when to apply which part of the animation at which point. So we need to insert something. Look at that snippet. That snippet, that little code snippet, is now part of our auto rig nodes. And you see, I could just interact with it. I just commented something out. The whole functionality changes instantly. And if you look really closely, you might think, yeah, it kind of looks like Python, right? It does look a lot like Python. It feels like Python, but it isn't Python. Python always just operates on your rig, but it never is your rig. That is simply not possible. Apex script can be exactly that because Apex script is nothing but a code interface, a Python code interface for our Apex graphs. So what you see here and down there, this is exactly the same thing. Good thing about it is you can just create like a small snippet, add something, you're done with it when you're familiar with code. If you're not familiar with code, you can still read those notes. They're all there. You can read them. And as I said, that that function up there is part of your rig. So now that we know more about that, we of course want to come back to our spider and see what else we can do with it. So it would be boring if it would be just eight legs. So we create 44. And same thing applies. By the way, we just have one node now because we use the rig script. You still have a lot of cool parameters to tweak it and you can animate all 44 uh, four legs individually if you really want to. Or you we uh, dial in our wonderful little walk adaption. And now we can send this little or big creature, we're still not sure yet if it lives underwater or in mountains, along, and we can move, as I said, a, a, each leg individually. If you want to, you can do this exactly here. So, but now that we've seen this, let's move on to uh, other creatures in the animal kingdom and let's move up in the air, coming to our toucan. So the token being created by um, Andrei Bilichenko will be part of the content library. And the content library field will not just be a simple groom file. We want to push it a lot further. So let's look here at the token. That's a little bit sad for an animator, as you see. So let's dress up our token. 
we are creating an add groom node. And you can simply add your groom in there and you get directly a smooth deformation of your groom for the animator. And that will help you tremendously with the silhouette. If you think about a creature like a bird where the feathers very much define what the, what the character actually is. And we don't just want to have a preview of that behavior. We actually also want to control and animate it. So we select a few of those feathers uh, on the add groom node and they instantly get turned into guide controls. And you can see that very smooth interpolation in between them and also along them, giving you wonderful uh, curvature that will help you to style now those wings um, individually. And the same concept can be directly applied to any other groom. So here we have Cappy with a mohawk. And if you really want to style it and animate it now as an animator, you have a much better idea of what's going on with that hair. And you might as well just leave it at that or you still post process it. So you have the option of choice there, but as an animator, you have a much better understanding. And of course, we want to set up certain things, maybe procedurally again. So all these groups for your guide controls can also be created um, procedurally. And in this case, we want to do something very specific. So we are creating a lot more guide controls. And we can also define the influence areas of these guides, of how far they push in. And what we can do now is we can truly really style the groom. So we can even give him like a bit of a different look and shape the silhouette even more in detail. Talking about having influence of the shape, we have some very, very complicated problems usually when you have birds, as in a closed wing position. So we want to find good generic solutions that help us here. This is a combination of a pose blend, and that pose blend, again, is available for any rig that you're building, together with groom blend shapes. And you can get like a very nice non-linear transition that the animator has even very good fine control in, in dialing those motions in. And again, it's a groom blend shape. You can have a blend shape for all kinds of things. You can have a blend shape for puffing, maybe for a more ruffled up look. You can be very creative in that and you can talk back and forth with your um, character effects artist setting it up, getting it much closer to animation when you're working it and simply closing actually those iteration cycles much more between character effects and animation. Now that we're happy with our creature, we of course want to render it eventually. You can take the feather surfaces that we are getting as a result from the animation right away, go to rendering, be happy with that. That is completely fine. Feather surfaces are very lightweight. Or you post-process them as we did here. So we have a TED volume mesh. We're constraining it to these big colored feathers. And we also constrain the root directly to the skin. And then we get a very nice volume preserving simulation on top for these like subtle contained secondary motions. And with that, again, we're just getting uh, we're just getting those um, surfaces out. We can go to rendering and get our toucan right into nature where it lives and is happy. And of course, and we are good to go. So now that we of course saw that we have so much control over, uh, over feather setups, we also want to bring the bird eventually into the air and animate it. And to see what we can do there, I'm going to invite my colleague Warren to the stage. Thank you, Esther. Um, so today, we may as well just jump right in here. And um, like Esther just introduced our new Toucan uh, character here. Uh, but the first thing you'll notice is up in the right corner, we have our new uh, animation layers pane. And we can create that pane, uh, create a new layer, uh, either by creating an empty layer and adding controls to it. Or since I have my selection sets already set up, what I can do is I can just select on them and create a layer from selected controls. And by default, layers are created as an additive layer, but we can also go into the settings and we can uh, switch that to be an override layer if we want. We also have a toggle there so we can show layer membership. So if you want to check out all the controls that are part of it, you can easily see that. And we also have the ability to uh, right click on that layer. And what that'll do is it'll select our, uh, all the controls in that layer, and it will also scope uh, any of our channels in our graph editor for us. Now, I'm just going to change the name of this layer to be called Feathers, because we'll take a look now at some of the groom and the feather uh, controls that Esther mentioned. And so if I just turn it on, 
And what these uh, new groom uh, of these feathers uh, enable us is a really nice way to get some detail and nice behavior from the feathers as we're posing our character. So if we look at the back here and I rotate the wings up and down, you can see on the back, we're actually getting some nice behavior from the back feathers. We can also grab the uh, uh, wing feather controls, start sculpting and shaping the wings uh, feathers as we need. And if you take a look at the neck area here, uh, as I rotate the head back, you can see how the neck feathers all splay out. And as I continue to pose the character, we can see how they still change and flatten out in certain areas and stay fl uh, splayed in others. But we can also just have some controls just for the feathers themselves. So if I wanted to puff up the back of the toucan, we could just kind of rotate them around. If I wanted to add some subtle breathing, I can easily just take the chest feathers, start rotating them in and out. Uh, I could take the head feathers, start ruffling the head feathers up or flattening them down if I wanted to, and uh, continue on with the back feathers uh, and continue on animating as we want. Now, this gives us a lot of control, a lot of ability to get some detailed motion in animation. But if an uh, animator is going to spend all that time doing all this animation, getting all this detail in there, uh, we want to make sure that that information isn't lost as we go down the pipe into rendering. So the great thing about these uh, animation feathers is that they actually deform the groom and drive the simulation, allowing us to visualize our feathers in real time uh, while getting an accurate re representation of the groom while we animate. So this is really great because now all that effort, all that time that animators spend in trying to get their shot final, doing all this feather detail, now as it goes down the pipe, it should be represented in the render. Next, we have uh, Lucha, and if we were going to take a look at the ball being tossed in the air, we want to see how that ball is moving. Uh, what we can now do is we can look at our motion paths. And we have more plans for these motion paths, uh, but it's really great to be able to see our keys, our spacing, and our arcs all in the viewport while we're animating. And you can start adjusting it. You don't need to be on the frame. You can just grab any of the keys, start moving them around, start shaping it by seeing the ticks, seeing how our spacing is working, and uh, easily just update it as we go along. We can also, if we want to just focus on one uh, small area of it, we can uh, limit the number of frames before or after, just having an a easier um, uh, motion path to look at, or we can take a look at the whole thing. Now, if I move these around, we were all happy with the spacing and the arcs. Uh, what we can see here is that the ball is actually intersecting through the hand quite a bit. So we can take a look at our new transient constraints and how to remedy this. And so our transient constraints are essentially a way to uh, visualize and easily adjust and um, manage our constraints in our scene. So if I wanted to do something such as uh, constrain the ball to the hand, I can just select the driven, I can select the driver, I can select my frame range, and when I hit A, now it creates a constraint for us between the ball and the hand. But you also notice that there's an orange bookmark that it created for us in the time bar. And so now we have a really quick visual way to see when that constraint is on or off. So if I go outside that bookmark and I select the hand, what we can do, we see the ball is not going with the hand. But if I go back into that bookmark area, now we can see that the ball is constrained again to the hand. So it's really great to be able to just quickly see when a constraint is on or off. And we can also take a look at uh, setting that up for the other hand as we want. So as we go over, we do the exact same thing. We just select the driven. Then we can select the driver. We can select our frame range in there. And this time, before I hit A, I'm going to go over and change the bake mode. And uh, previously, we had on dense, which puts a key on every single frame for that ball. Uh, but I'm just going to put it on update. And what this will do is create the constraint and just update all those uh, the existing keys that we have for that ball. And you also notice that it put out a gray bookmark there. And that's because the ball now has a, a second uh, driver for it. So now we can see not only we have the two uh, constraints where they are, but that we have two different drivers for that ball. And at any time here, we can turn off the constraint just by toggling off auto update. And now when we move it, now it's just in its world space keyed. Um, but if we wanted to, again, put that right back in the hand, all we have to do is go to uh, a frame where it's in the hand, toggle that uh, back on, and when we hit A, now it'll update our offsets for us, all constrained right in the hand again. And we can take a look at the one where it was intersecting quite a bit through it, do the same thing. We grab our, uh, select our driven, select our driver, select our frame range, and hit A. 
And in this case, I actually want to edit it back onto dense, so I'm just going to put it on dense keys again, hit A, and now we have a key on every frame, and you can see it's now not intersecting at all with the hand. And you also notice that I created another orange bookmark, and that's because it's the exact same driver as the beginning of our shot. So really quickly, we're able to see exactly when that ball is constrained to hands, and then we have two separate drivers in here. Now, um, of course, this being uh, Houdini, we can always use a little bit of proceduralism in here. So if I bring in my network, we can see I have a yellow ball and I have an orange cube. And I'm just going to do a uh, procedurally swap out the geometry just by with, with a switch. And now we can see we have an orange cube in there. But if I select the control, we'll notice that uh, the control has the exact same constraints, same keys, same animation. But um, obviously a box is much different shape than, the, than a sphere. So it's intersecting through the hand quite a bit. But again, transient constraints, we can update this really easily just by going on a frame, moving it on one frame, and even with dense keys, it updates all those offsets automatically for us. And we could do it again for the second hand. And in this case, I had it on uh, just updating the keys before, but now with the dents, now it could put a key on every frame. So you could decide if you want to keep it just with updating the keys or making it uh, the dense keys on the bake. And we can go to the final one again, do the exact same thing, or we can just shift it up on one frame and we get that automatically offsets updated throughout that. So we've been able to really quickly be able to procedurally swap out our geometry um, and, and be able to update our offsets really quickly with our constraints. And this is a pretty simple little example. So let's take a look at something a little bit more complicated. And here we have Lucha and he's got 25 switches going on here with the three balls and the two hands. But I did it the exact same way. I just, uh, with this selecting the driven and the driver, and you can see all my bookmarks at the bottom showing exactly when that hand is uh, constrained in a, uh, when the ball is constrained in a hand. And um, by the color coding, we can see that we have two different drivers for it as well. Now, if I wanted to go through and fix all the motion of the air in uh, where these balls are in the air, I could use motion paths, but uh, that would be a lot of manual work. And since in Houdini 20, we introduced dynamic motion, now, all by setting our grab and release frames and our center of mass, we get physically accurate motion. So now um, our spacing, our uh, arcs, and our height of it is all based on the keying that I set, the timing of that. And we get really, really nice natural motion in a fraction of the time than it would take me to do that by hand. And normally what I would do now is I would bake out my essential keys. And previously, that would bake it down onto my original animation lens. But now we have our uh, bake keys to new layer toggle there so that when I bake these essential keys now with that toggled on, what it'll do is it'll create a brand new layer for me called dynamic motion. And I can go in there and I can just change that name. I can make it, uh, call it blue. I can change the color coding of it so it's blue so it's easier to spot. I can move it down to the other two balls, the white and the red ones that I previously done the dynamic motion on, but I just have those layers muted right now. So if we want to turn them on and see how it's all looking now, um, what we can do is we could play it through and to activate those layers, all I have to do is unmute them. So now we could see all three balls, now all physically accurate motion, uh, really quick, all based on the timing of when the grabs and release happen. And like our previous example, we can procedurally swap out the geometry as well. So if we want to switch the three balls, we can always do that and we can switch it into three different objects. And now while we're juggling that, we can also look at it and it is an animation layering system. So we can do an additive layer and I can just start adding rotations to all three of those objects as they're juggling. And finally, I can adjust uh, Lucha's eye line because he was looking too high based on my original animation versus the dynamically uh, accurate one. So really quickly, we've been able to take our dynamic motion, be able to bake that out onto a new layer so it's non-destructive and continue adding uh, animation on top of that. And next, uh, we have Lucha, and I've just did a sh shooting some hoops. Uh, and one thing I use uh, 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 animation layers for a lot is to try different things really quickly. So I just took that animation and just did one where he's dribbling the ball behind his back instead. And if I was to take a look at the ball next, I, again, I could key that all by hand, but I like to save myself some time. And for something like this, I can turn that ball into a ragdoll ball. And now I get that motion generated for me for free going through the but we can still change that motion really quickly 
All we have to do is select the backboard and just by changing one parameter, just the bounce parameter here, we can go from a value of 0.3 where I sink in the bucket to 0.9 where it kind of bounces in and out. And then if we go down to 0.7, what we'll have is a nice little bounce bouncing around the rim before he uh, sinks the bucket. And like the dynamic motion, we now have a toggle so that we can bake our keys to a new layer. So as I start recording this, um, what we could see is that we'll get a new layer show up called Ragdoll. And I can set as few keys as I want on this or as many keys as I want on this to decide how much data I want to uh, use as I continue animating. And now when we go out, I turn on that ball. What we'll see is that there's no animation until it goes into the Ragdoll. And that's because the Ragdoll is created as an override layer. But all we have to do to fix that, select the frame range, right click on it, set a layer weight from play bar selection. And now we have that automatically keyed for us. So now when we play it through, we have all the motion before, all with the nice ragdoll motion on it. And if we want to go back to the original animation where he's dribbling in front, we can just mute the behind the back layer. And now we have all the motion still all hooking up. So it's a really quick way to start getting different options, different ideas uh, quickly to see what works best for your shot. We also have a new copy and paste feature. So if I want to put the barbell in Electra's hand, I can select her hand and copy selection or control C. I can select the barbell control and paste uh, world transforms or control V. And now we've automatically pasted it up to that control. So it's a really great way to start being able to uh, copy and paste controls to each other. And when we have it here, we can still use our selection sets and our volatile hotkey control shift. So now I can move Electra and the barbell together without needing a constraint. We've also uh, created another tool, a mirror tool. And when we right click on there and mirror with plane, we can see we have a few different uh, options to look at here. So if I turn off the outline overlay, what we'll be able to see is just a live preview of that mirror. So um, before we commit that post to anything, we can see what it looks like before we do it. But I like the outline overlay uh, just so I can compare it to the previous post. And now we've mirrored it from the right hand to the left hand, and I can still shift it around so that it's uh, mirroring around the ankle area too. And once I'm happy with what I want, I can just hit enter, and now we have the key. So we've been able to copy and paste that barbell to the hand, and we've been able to mirror it from the right hand to the left hand very easily, very quickly. Now, uh, for the basketball one, I did some ragdoll generating some motion on a prop. Uh, now let's take a look at getting some ragdoll motion uh, generated for a character that I could start using. So obviously we want the spinning back fist to hit the metal Electra and her to react to it. So if we turn on our uh, ragdoll for a metal Electra, we can see she just gets knocked right down, falls to the ground. But if I wanted to change that behavior so that maybe she just gets hit, recovers and goes back to her original position, we can do that very easily. So if I just select the whole ragdoll and turn on uh, match world transforms, now from here, I'm only going to uh, uh, change two parameters. In. And the two parameters I'm going to adjust is the position stiffness and the orientation stiffness. And so as we look at it through, she's falling to the ground. Now we can just set a key on both of them, set a value of 10 on position stiffness, set a value of 10 on orientation stiffness as well. And now when we go back and we scrub it through, now we can see that uh, she gets hit and recovers back to her original spot. We also have a really nice feature um, that instead of looking at the collision objects here, what we can do is uh, we have a new visualizer where we can actually look at the skin geometry. And this is really great because now we can start working with our rag doll while sealing our, our skin character. And looking at this, I wanted to delay the arms a little bit so that they come up at a different timing than the rest of the body. We can just select the sets that, uh, for the arms that I have. Again, we can go into the position stiffness and the orientation stiffness, set a lower value of two. And then now when we play it through, we can see that the arms will be coming up slower than the rest of the body. And you can continue doing that. You can offset the torso, the head, offset the arms individually. And once you're happy with it, you can start baking it, that out to a new ragdoll layer. And that's just what I've done here. So I'll turn on Metal Electra and we can take a look at the layers. They're all muted right now. And just as I activate them, we can go from her not getting hit. Then we can go into her getting hit and recovering. And from there, I just built some animation on top, so now she'll just do a punch back. And if we want the wooden Electra to react to that punch, we can also do another layer on there where she just leans out of the way. And we can continue doing that. So it's a really great way to be able to take some basic animation, 
add some ragdoll to try and get uh, generate some motion for us and be able to continue animating from there. But of course, sometimes you just want a big ragdoll hit here. And one of the things I do sometimes is instead, I don't want to change any of this spinning back fist animation or anything else. So I'll just use a simple object as a cube and use that as a, a ragdoll character as a collider. And just by setting two keys, just setting the speed of that uh, cube or the, and or the uh, direction of it, you can change how that uh, reaction of that ragdoll is behaving. So really quickly, you can do a whole bunch of them and render out a bunch of different layers. So you have a lot of different uh, things to look at. So here I've just done a couple of them. And uh, what we go from, again, just by unmuting, activating those layers, we can go from not being hit at all to one where she kind of gets knocked out and falls right down to one where I really accentuated the speed of the cube so that we now accent that punch a lot more and she does a flip right over. So it's really quick to be able to not have to change a whole bunch of animation, use something simple and just set a couple of keys to get a lot of variety in there. We've also begun uh, with our ragdoll posing. So if I rotated our hand down, we could see that the fingers are going directly through the table. Uh, but if I grab those fingers and I activate them by using control E, what I can do now is when we rotate that hand down, we can see they're no longer intersecting through the table. They're now interacting with it. So we can begin uh, posing our character interacting with objects. And of course, we probably want it to interact with itself as well. So if we grab the arm and we move it over to the head, all I need to do is select that head and I can activate that. Now, when I grab that hand control, now you can see the head reacting entirely to how the hand is being posed. And we can do that in reverse too. If we, what we can do is activate the hand control and then as I animate the, um, the head uh, control, it will start pushing against the hand and interacting with it that way. We are also able to uh, select the fingers and we can just add some gravity onto these as well. And now we have a better contact on the head. So really quickly, we're starting to be able to pose our character interacting with objects and posing it interacting with itself. And now to tie everything together a little bit, we're back to our toucan and it's picking up a bucket. And then we can do a ragdoll layer on top of that. And what we can have is the ragdoll with the character and the toucan interacting with it. I could then continue animating on top of that and have the uh, toucan get up. I could do another layer, just playing around with head shakes at the end, just trying, trying a few different things and continue on from there. But uh, what will happen sometimes is you don't want to have all those layers. I don't need two layers for a head shake. So I can just grab whatever I want to clean up, select those layers and merge selected layers. And I've been able to clean up my uh, layer pane uh, very quickly. And so with this 20.5 release with our toucan, our feathers, and hopefully some motion, There we go. Um, and so with this 20.5 release with our toucan, our feathers, our motion paths, our animation layers, our copy paste and mirror tools, ragdoll improvements and transient constraints, previously released uh, features such as dynamic motion, animation sliders, volatile hotkey for posing, selection sets, bookmarks, plus many, many more. There's a lot of great things in here for animators. And we'll continue to be adding more features, more tools and workflow with every Houdini release. And here's something from our friends at Odd Studios have put together, showcasing some of the features from Houdini 20 and the upcoming Houdini 20.5. Hope you enjoy. Where is our house? Oh, he's in the game. Look at what he is saying. 
Stuff. Good stuff. Um, hey, are we on a boat? Does anybody know by any chance? Um, okay, so uh, lots of great stuff in characters. I mean, it's hard to believe it's a 0.5 release. We did cover a lot of ground in seven months. Um, the tools are still in beta. Um, there's still a lot of work we want to do. Some uh, usability features, performance, more things to come around. Support for physics, full body IK, uh, nonlinear motion editor, pose library, character finaling, things like that, full humanoid and quadruped uh, rigs for faster setup available to you coming soon. Not there yet. Um, lots and lots of learning material, always things on the um, content library and stuff like that. We're always working on that and trying to improve that stuff so you guys can get up and running. Uh, so next up, we have Solaris and Parm. So we're very, very happy to hear that everybody has been switching over to USD. A lot of people have been using Karma and Solaris together. And so it's just really exciting to hear that that is progressing. And uh, we've been listening, as Kristen said in the very beginning, we've been listening to all the pain points that some people are experiencing with Solaris and Karma, and we are doing our best and have done our best to address as much as we could in this release, and we will continue to do so. Um, but to talk more about that, we'll have Rob PK come up and take you through Solaris and Karma. Hey, thank you so much. Good afternoon to you all. Thank you for having me here. We're going to dive straight in and start talking about Karma. You're going to see it in the slides to come, but I now personally use Karma XPU rather than OpenGL or Vulkan in my viewport 90% of the time. And really, it's just because it is so, so, so fast for the work that I do. This is the same scene we used in the Houdini 20.0 launch, not at all optimized for Houdini 20.5. And both of these were rendered at home on my uh, home PC, leveraging an RTX 4090. But now Karma U P <laughs> sorry, Karma XView has adaptive sampling. It can take advantage of NVIDIA's new ADA architecture. It just benefits from a whole suite of new improvements. And here we are, just a minute and a half into rendering, Karma XPU in Houdini 20.5 is done. While the 20.0 build, not even a third of the way through yet. So let me switch from Karma to Solaris and our effort to really increase the artist's power without needing them to switch context to get their work done. We've heard what you've said, and here I want to highlight our reworking of the stage manager and the control that you now have directly in the viewport. Whether it's the placement of a single asset, the layer of a cluster of assets, or even the control you have over variant sets, which of course could be variations in model style or material or, or more. And those assets can be further aggregated, and then those aggregates can be modified again, working powerfully and intuitively, almost entirely in the viewport, if you wish. Now, keeping on the theme of working in context, we have a new quick surface material node. We got the feedback that needing to always use a material library and a material X builder, it just kind of pulled you away from those other nodes that you were working with. So quick material should make it much easier and faster for you to do your look development directly inside of LOPS. And if you're using a component builder workflow, the creation of quick materials has been placed right at your fingertips, right there in the component material node. So now we can do a quick passive look development, in this case on these wooden shelves, we'll just assign some texture maps, and it'll go and repeat the effort again for the frame, make it kind of a nice dark metal. Now, sometimes, okay, fine, you do need to still jump between different contexts, maybe into SOPs in this case, to add a little bit of life to an otherwise static scene. But with Houdini 20.5, we've really improved the artist's visual context, providing a ghost version of the entire scene, everything except the bits that are actually being modified, those bits being presented exclusively as SOPs geometry. And this allows for real-time manipulation. There is no SOPs USD conversion going on here. You can work with your SOPs at full speed. And if you want to check that your work looks right in the render, Good news, we now bring your Solaris cameras directly into SOPS for you to use in that viewport. And here's the result of that, rendered, of course, using Karma XPU. Working with cloned rendering is a lot easier in Houdini 20.5. You can either drag LOP nodes directly into the clone, clone control panel, or perhaps even more keeping you in the context of Solaris, 
you can launch clones directly from a loft node's pop-up menu. Now, I think the single most requested feature we got of our cloned rendering was to support multiple AOVs, the way that we do in the render gallery snapshots. So that's now in place, with all of the AOVs being captured by default. Speaking of snapshots, our live clones now support snapshotting without any disconnecting or interruption, allowing you just to keep working and working and working. We've had crowds in Solaris for quite a while now, but never before has it been possible to work at the scale that we can today. Borrowing ideas we had in Mantra and leveraging the procedural framework that we use for fur, for feathers, oceans, etc., we're now able to optimize our crowd rendering by identifying similar poses between our agents and instancing those agents in these cases. And like our other procedurals, this isn't Karma specific, though of course we hope Karma XPU will be your renderer of choice. Now, I hope it's almost impossible for you to pick up the visual change between these two crowds, but it's pretty easy to pick up the change in the statistics, with huge savings in both memory and render time, comparing the right with the procedural to the left without. Now, upgrading the version of USD that we use in Solaris has also allowed us to add light instancing to Karma. Between all those undershelf tubes and those bulbs up in the strings of the rafters there, this image is lit by about 5,000 individual lights. And one of the common motivations for light instancing is something like traffic simulation, where you have car assets that need to carry lights with them, traveling, motion blurring together. And it's perhaps a little bit subtle in this example, but we have the ability to add per instance overrides as well, providing slightly different uh, intensities or colors of those headlights from car to car, just adding a little bit of natural variation to the scene. Now, being able to add a Karma lens shader or lens material is also right at your fingertips now, using the Karma tab of the camera law. Rather being, than being taken to a different context, the lens material, it's just part of your LOP network, where you can tweak the parameters you need to achieve your final look easily, quickly. And this is also further aided by the Intel denoiser, which now runs interactively on the GPU. So with only a small number of clicks, we can take this image, which I think already looked pretty good, but perhaps it lacks a bit of a central point of focus, and get to this image, which really highlights and draws your eyes to that middle shelving unit. Now, I opened with this image, so let me come back to it as a close to my section, and I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the atmospheric rendering that we've added. The physical sky system we added to Houdini 20.0, it made it pretty easy to set up physically plausible lighting. But now we've gone above and beyond, adding a new mode with full volumetric atmospherics. The gradation of color in the sky, it's much richer, and the god rays cutting through the gaps in those clouds, personally, I think is absolutely gorgeous. I'm going to let you soak it in for a little bit here and enjoy this time lapse of our volumetrics. And really, the last thing for me to do is to bring the one and only Mr. Scott Keating back up to the stage. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much. He only said that because there's two Robs, so it's just to keep everybody straight. There's only one of me. Um, okay, so modeling. Um, let's just jump right into some of the modeling updates in 20.5. So we're going to start out with a really interesting new tool, the Planar Inflate. Um, it's sort of unique, and it has this sort of a strange purpose, but it does exactly as it says it inflates things. So it can create these sort of patterns like this, inflated things like pillows or quilts and things like that. But let's take it a little bit further. We're gonna we're gonna uh, just adjust some of the size here so we get a more dense mesh, and then we're gonna do a quad remesh on it. In this case, very simple, just to get some cleaner geometry, and then move right into our new sculpt tool. So this is a sculpting tool that's designed to work on very high res dense meshes and give you nice interactive sculpting capabilities using you know in the viewport brushes, the kind of brushes you expect, move brushes, crease brushes, um, and so on. Um, and so this is just the beginning stage of this sculpting tool set. This is um, using, you know, a single resolution of mesh uh, that you work on, you know, in a standard way. Uh, but look for more changes there in the future. However, it is nice to see that we can take that sculpt output and plug it right into our new wrinkle deformer that works in SOPS and then take advantage of that to add on to our sculpt for extra detail. In this case, we're just using the bend SOP there to add these uh, wrinkles, and we can change the size and shape of those wrinkles 
And now we have a new result that we could then continue to sculpt on. So it really opens up the possibility of this iterative back and forth between sculpting and procedural tools. And here we're just looking at it in the Vulkan viewport and then over to an XPU render with this nice texture map just to pull out all the, the detail that we, we added. We've also completely rewritten the uh, old clip sop. Um, and one of the key reasons was performance so that we could work on very high res dense meshes like you're seeing here. Um, but also to add, you know, quality of life features like filling in the faces in the same node that you're doing the clipping in, even when there are multiple sort of holes in the mesh as we scrub through this geometry. We've also added a new interactive state so you can draw the clipping plane interactively and grab this plane and move it back and forth. And you'll notice that we have a new transform handle as well to simplify the artist's workflow here, make it clearer about where the plane is and how it moves through uh, 3D space. But we didn't stop there with just standard clipping planes. We've also added a new mode that lets you do standard clipping, but also use a noise attribute or any attribute really to use as your clipping plane essentially. And so here now we can use that noise and clip along the values of the noise. So this opens up a whole new way of clipping your mesh in a way that I think would be really useful for effects work or motion graphics where you want to create dissolving type effects or maybe even vellum tearing type of effects. And by the way, if you might notice in the bottom right-hand corner, this panel, and this is the middle mouse button information panel, the one that you all sort of work with if you're using Houdini. We now have revamped it visually, um, and we've also added the ability to add it into a pane permanently. So you can have it permanently in a window while you're working, rather than uh, following it down the network uh, as you might have done in the past. And you'll also notice that we can do things like toggle on the visualizers using these little toggles which is something you could do in the past, but now we've added some visual information to let you know which attributes you're actually visualizing and how to turn them on and off, sort of bringing some of those invisible features to the surface. And here's just a closer look at what the panel looks like. It is currently only in some of our contexts, and we're going to expand outward from there to get functionality that makes sense for the various contexts. But you can see here a visual overhaul, hopefully to make things clearer, easier to find, categorize things using colors, and so on. So the idea is to take the information that was there, bring it up to the surface, and put it directly in your hands. So here's another interesting tool that's sort of an expansion of some of our point cloud tools from uh, 20.0. Uh, so it may be a little hard to see on this, uh, on this image here, but there's no surface here. This is entirely a point cloud, so it's there's no geometry, there are no polygons, it's just points. Uh, but we're still able to measure that point cloud and pull out things like uh, curvature or density, which is really interesting because you're doing that without having to go through a meshing stage ahead of time. And so that opens up some interesting possibilities for working directly from that point cloud. So we're going to do a point cloud reduction was a tool that we uh, created in 20.0. And you can see we have the orientation on those points, even though there was no surface to begin with, as well as the area for each point where we can stamp these uh, little disks in this case to sort of fill up uh, the surface. And then this becomes something interesting that you can do, you know, interesting effects like scattering these uh, disks to create almost a pseudo surface on top of uh, the point cloud, uh, or just use the point clouds to do things like stick arrows to a horse, you know, typical visual effects stuff. Um, or uh, even more sort of abstract effects like this, where in this case, we're using the points inside in the volume of the horse and aligning these gears and uh, uh, sort of pistons in between each of the things in this more abstract look. So I think there's a lot of possibilities here using this uh, one in some senses is a, just like almost a mathematical tool, but still opening up a ton of possibilities for things like motion graphics or abstract effects like this. So one more time, I'm going to bring up uh, the other Rob <laughs> to the stage to talk about environments and uh, side effects labs. So thank you very much. All right. Thanks again, Scott. Um, so in particular with environments, I'm going to talk about Project Dryad, uh, which is a biomes project from the team of Side Effects Labs. It's currently in alpha. 
Um, but I know a lot of people have known that we've been working on this for some time. And so by popular uh, demand, we are going to make it available early so that you can get out there and try it out and give us some valuable feedback. We want to hear from you and, and hear how, what you feel about the tools. Uh, so the tool set is designed to be a sophisticated vegetation scattering system, you know, using realistic real world uh, data points. Like, so we've been researching how climate, biomes, uh, vegetation, how it all influences each other, how to describe this dynamic relationship in Houdini. So we consider a, a wide range of factors such as terrain, sunlight, temperature, precipitation, water retention, soil quality, um, and more. In future phases, we'll also be working on algorithms that will simulate the evolution of a biome over time, how plants will spread their seeds, compete with each other, um, and affect the terrain. Um, for the image you see here, we didn't use any satellite height maps for the terrain. Uh, we used our new sculpting tool, in fact, to art direct the terrain base shapes instead of, and then ran it through Houdini's height fields um, and for finer details and stuff. More artist friendly instead of starting out with height field noises and masks and, and big base shapes. Uh, so the goal of the project is to create a biome workflow that is ultimately fast and intuitive um, for artists, but um, under the hood, very much grounded in a scientific basis so that it can capture the sort of more nuanced, natural looking details, uh, you know, better than maybe traditional scattering methods. Uh, so this is a biome scatter point cloud from Houdini uh, that was brought into Unreal Engine 5. You'll be able to use the tool set with your game engine, but we're also not just focusing on game environments. We're, we're looking to create very high fidelity um, environments that can be used in TV and film as well. So we're not just focusing on the game engine side of things. Um, and really our focus from the labs team is to work together with R&D to enhance that user experience, to bridge that gap between um, Houdini and game engines and to make that experience as pleasant as possible. Been working on things like uh, improved performance with Houdini Engine in particular uh, for this release. Uh, our Houdini Engine along with Unreal, um, who we have a great relationship with. Um, so it's all about boosting that performance and experience for the artists. So with that little short bit on Houdini uh, Side Effects Labs and Biomes, I'm going to turn it back over to Scott to bring us home. Okay, thank you once again. Uh, so, Copernicus. So, Project Copernicus, uh, as Kristen mentioned earlier, is our sort of new platform, a new context for image manipulation of all sorts, whether it's ML, texture synthesis, uh, compositing. Um, to start out with, uh, even though we do have compositing nodes um, in uh, Copernicus for this uh, release, our focus was on the image manipulation and texture synthesis side of things. So let's just dive right in and take a look at some of the possibilities that are available uh, in this beta version of Copernicus. So right away, you're going to dive into SOPS and inside the new Copernicus network. And you'll see right away that we get this 3D version of a 2D image. It's sitting in 3D space. And that's really important to the overall philosophy of Copernicus, which is that we're always living in 2D and 3D sort of together. And to start out, we're, we're just building some basic noises here. So different fractal noises, whirly noise. Um, and we're just doing some basic remapping. With the goal here, we want to create a, a basic texture map that uh, maybe represents some sort of stone or concrete with some paint on it or something like that. So we're just going to do some remapping. We're going to remap that um, black and white image into color, just add some sort of dirt and grunge into those cracks. Um, then we're going to add sort of a paint color on the outside, this sort of bluish color. Add a little more noise to this, just add a little surface detail so it you know, feels like maybe it's a bumpy surface or something along those lines. And you can see we're getting really fast performance as we're changing these, uh, which is really important. Again, that goes back to the whole OpenCL uh, engine that's running all this stuff. So we've created sort of a color map here. Let's go ahead and maybe create something like a specular map or a roughness map. So we'll invert it so it's rougher in the crevices than on the surface. And then we'll use a height to normal uh, node to generate a normal map from that essentially height information. 
I think the key to this whole process is not to work sort of abstractly the way we have so far, but instead to use this preview material where I can just quickly hook up my standard sort of PBR texture inputs um, and then see the result directly in the viewport as I'm working. So as I visualize this node, you can see we had the normal map. It's responding to the lighting. This is all in the new Vulkan viewport. So let's go ahead and adjust this a little bit again. We're just going to tweak the uh, roughness a bit um, just to show how this updates live in the viewport as you're working. And then why not go ahead and plug something into height as well? So we also have displacements uh, in the viewport, in the Vulcan viewport here. So you're starting to get a really nice high fidelity result as you're working on your uh, texture maps, even in this sort of simple network. But now let's jump over to Solaris and just use a scene import. And that's going to pull in the geometry and the material and all the texture maps so that you can start rendering it immediately using Karma XPU. And you can see that we can set that up now and get a nice render, jump back to our Copernicus network, start making changes, and you still get those sort of live updates as it's rendering. So you have this sort of full pipeline from working node to node, looking at this 2D version of things, to the preview material all the way to final render, working together. You also see that the preview material comes with different sort of test geometry. So you can see how things look on pre-UV geometry, just so you can quickly switch between them, see how things look on a torus versus a tube and so on. Just a nice way of testing out uh, your material in different lighting conditions on different shapes. Um, you can also add your own uh, geometry input to this, and we'll come to that a little bit later. So, okay, let's look at some fundamental tools here. That was a little preview, but let's start with SDF shape. So here we start out with this interesting representation, it's sort of a mathematical representation of all these different shapes. What's interesting about that is that you can work with them before in some sense they become pixels, which is what happens with this uh, node where we basically are rasterizing it now into pixels. And that gives us a lot of control, not only over the shape, but the interpretation of that shape. So we have the distance to the edges, for instance, so I can easily remap those, those edges and create interesting sort of patterns. So Let's just, again, plug it into our preview material here so you can see how it looks. And now we're starting to create sort of interesting combinations of effects. And again, working in this sort of part before we've, in some sense, turned them into pixels means we get really clean things like Booleans out of these things. So we can combine these shapes together while still retaining all that rich SDF information that's there. So as I combine these shapes together, I don't sort of mangle the results. Um, I can wait until they're pixels and then operate on them further from there. And that means, you know, we can keep layering this. So subtract them together, do an intersection and start getting really uh, complex patterns and results out of the other side um, when we're ready to turn it into a more floor, full featured pattern. And here I'm just scaling things down to give you sort of a, a look at how these things all combine together, but still give you this stable um, effect out the other side. Um, and there are lots of these pre-built shapes, these SDF shapes. There's actually quite a lot more than what we're showing here, but they started to get too small on screen. So we, we kept them with this uh, number. So these shapes are obviously, you know, base shapes like uh, circles, rectangles, and so on, but also things like uh, these rounded uh, edge uh, shapes, or uh, on the bottom you see a, uh, an arc uh, being carved out of a circle, or in the top left, this sort of swirly uh, line shape. So not only do you have all these base shapes, but you also have lots of parameters for every shape to influence their overall look. And then just to show you how you might use this on a more sort of complex design, here we're basically creating kind of a, uh, maybe it's a, a wall tile or a ceiling tile, um, and you can see them animating it. We're kind of just doing that to demonstrate, you know, how all the shapes come together, but you also can animate these parameters uh, using standard Houdini animation tools. The other thing you can see is that, again, because we have that sort of remapping capability, we're easily able to do things like, we'll add um, a gold leaf to the tops of these. Maybe this is a plaster design or something like that. And we can do that because we have access to all that information. Um, and by the way, these animations you're seeing are all done in the viewport. These are not XPU renders. Okay, so let's look at another sort of fundamental note here, just a distort. So distort by itself, not that interesting. It just moves pixels in, in a certain direction, but we can influence this. So let's start off with something simple like a ramp. And you can see we distort more at the top than we do at the bottom. We also streak it more at the top than we do at the bottom. We can use sort of a constant ramp here to offset things, slide them back and forth. 
which can be really useful when you're creating things like floorboards or something along those lines. Um, but we can take this uh, even further and create sort of pinching and bulging. And we're going to do that using another fundamental node, the slope direction. And that looks at the gradient of the input image and determines the direction from that. So you can easily create swirling type of effects, bulging and pinching type of effects. And of course, you can just use standard noises as input to that as well to create really interesting, almost curl noise looking um, effects on your geometry. So all this comes together to give you a lot of control using just these two nodes, really, the slope direction and the distort. Um, and this would be used to just combine with some of the noises we saw to do things like breaking up the edges of a texture um, and then adding a, a wider, larger distortion overall to break up that sort of clear Voronoi pattern. And then you can see adding a little more detail, just layering on some noise. So even with just like a handful of fundamental nodes, you can start to build up really complex, natural looking um, designs. So let's look at another one. So here we're gonna start with a UV map and it does something, you know, out of the box, not really that interesting. It gives you a UV map, a UV sample node. And when you combine them together, you basically get the same thing because it's just a square set of UVs. However, we have this UV transform node, which is really interesting because you notice that it's operating on the UVs not on the image itself. So we're manipulating the UVs here, not the uh, underlying grid. So just to sort of drive that home, let's build our own UV map um, as an input. So we're just gonna take this um, radial ramp and we're gonna combine it with a concentric ramp to basically create our own UV set here. And obviously you could import UVs from somewhere else as well, but this is just an example using our base nodes here. So I'll plug this all together, and now we get this nice UV map where the texture map is sort of stretched around a circle, essentially. And you can see we can modify the ramps to get more detail, or, or we can use the UV transform node to edit it. And some nodes, like this tile pattern node, output the UVs for you. So for each one of these uh, tiles, you get an ID, and you also get a UV map per tile. And I'm just going to put a multiply here at the end just to, to clarify the, the end result. The key thing is the UV transform node using the ID and the per tile UV set to be able to manipulate them individually. So now we can randomize the UVs per tile. We can rotate them randomly per tile. So you have a ton of control over how these things are placed together, which is really important when you're building up um, things like brick maps and so on. And the tile pattern node is fundamental. There's a ton of tile patterns built into this node. Again, this is not all. There are actually many more than this. Um, but you can see here, we're just different types of tiles based on real world brick patterns, by the way. So you can emulate actual patterns used um, in architecture. Um, and in this case, we just sort of randomized the values so you can see all the individual bricks. Um, but the node itself has a lot of functionality. We're not going to go through all that today. But one of the key things is you can inset each uh, brick individually. You can use the SDF shape as an input to, again, create that nice offset. And you can customize the rotation and scale of every tile. And then in the bottom right there, the tile pattern that you see is not one of the built-in ones. In fact, it's a custom tile pattern, just used as an example here, which has a UI for building your own custom tile patterns and also a small sort of scripting language for building more complex patterns that are maybe challenging to use, do using just the UI. So let's again take a look at maybe a more complex example using the same tools that we just walk through here. So we're just basically using the UV sets to define these sort of circular brick patterns in different layers. Um, and we're bringing in a pattern in the background and then this sort of central icon as well. Um, and really the animation here is just to show you where all the different UV patterns are, but you can see how quickly you can build up something uh, really interesting in this kind of maybe a cobblestone stone uh, walkway or a, a maybe even a, a decorative wall or something like that. So we've talked about 2D and 3D and things living in 2D and 3D, but uh, one of the other fundamental ideas of Copernicus is to tie the rest of Houdini into this context. You know, in the old cops world, you could technically sort of do that, but it was cumbersome. Um, there were a lot of edge cases that didn't work, and it was difficult to kind of actually do that. Um, that is no longer the case. Copernicus removes the barrier between the rest of Houdini and the compositing context. So here on the left, we have just some curves being manipulated procedurally just to create this sort of little animated uh, pattern. 
And on the right, we're taking all the information from the points on those curves, and we're using it to add the sort of stitching and deformation that you see around the pattern on the right. And this is using standard uh, instancing attributes that you might use for other reasons in uh, Houdini, as, as, uh, as well as the sprite uh, texture uh, attributes as well. So it can be used for things like um, paint strokes. So here we are drawing a, a curve um, in SOPS, and then we're seeing the result in, uh, in Copernicus. And you can see, again, using some of the tools that I just described to remap color ramps along the curves, um, change the size of the curves along their length, and add the distortion. So it feels like the, the ink or paint is sort of interacting with the texture um, in the background. And of course, the, as I mentioned earlier, this is all animatable. So you can do draw your, your uh, do your setup um, using the curves and then using, you know, basic tools like Curve and so on, um, animate the results into your texture map. So now you have the ability to not only generate the textures, but animate them uh, over time, which I think opens up a lot of really interesting possibilities for um, effects work, but also for things like motion graphic design. So underlying this whole idea is this node called stamp points. And on the left, what you're seeing is our soft point cloud with just some visualization so that you can see what's happening. And on the right is the result of taking this sort of leaf shape and inputting it into the stamp points node. So you can see that we're basically creating orientations um, in SOPs using standard SOP tools um, and then adding color to each of those points as well as a P scale. And that all comes into uh, the stamp points uh, node on the right inside of Copernicus. So you see this leaf texture or the field of leaves being uh, generated. And the node also has a lot of different ways to mix the values together. In this, in this case, it's doing kind of a, a max operation on each of those shapes. But it isn't a one-way street. It can go in and out as many times as you want. So here on the left, we're just starting with some really basic noise. Um, that sort of red and green pattern that you see there is the slope direction node, which is picking up the orientations based on the gradient of the, the noise. Um, down on the bottom there, you're seeing the point cloud again with the orientation and colors, and then on the right, the results. So we're starting in Copernicus, going to SOPs, and coming back into Copernicus to create this sort of field of grass and this clumping effect that's basically pulling out just from the noise. So you have a ton of control for how every one of the images in this standpoint node operates. And here's a, another interesting result where instead of just using uh, noises, we're actually taking a depth map of uh, the capybara here in his walk cycle and using that along with the slope direction node to align these sort of leaves to the surface of the capybara, creating this sort of interesting, I guess, cartoon-like effect of these leaves moving and, and aligning themselves to the animation. Um, but you might be wondering, well, where do we get this depth information uh, from, you know, obviously you could bake this all out from a render and bringing it into Copernicus, um, but it would be great to eliminate that step. Um, and that's exactly what this uh, Copernicus node uh, called rasterized geometry, which uses an uh, underlying Vulkan engine to rasterize 3D geometry into a 2D image. So here you can see Capybara sort of <laughs> stomping around, as he's known to do, um, generating uh, normals, depth, occlusion, curvature, area, a whole bunch of things. And in fact, this is not really a, a ray tracer. It's not really a texture baker. Um, it's something else. But it, we're looking to take this further in the future uh, to create something uh, with even more functionality. But for the moment, it's essentially taking attributes that exist on your geometry and rasterizing them into these 2D planes. So, okay, this is interesting, but what could we do with this? Like, what's an example? So let's start with the rigid body simulation. So this is just um, a bunch of stones falling to the ground in a rigid body simulation, creating a nice little pile of stones. Um, and on the right, you're seeing the texture projection into 2D space, um, basically from above in this case. Um, each of these maps represents different things. Um, depth, ID, so a different value per stone, um, alpha, curvature, and, and more. So let's build a little network here to take advantage of this. So we're going to start out really basically and just remap the, the depth information and basically invert it so we get the closest stuff closest to the camera, essentially. Plug it into our preview material. And right away, we have a texture map that's very believable. It looks like a pile of stones using a displacement map. 
So let's uh, add some uh, Copernicus uh, nodes into this and just create sort of a field of noise behind. And we'll just place it in 3D space by changing the depth value. We'll go ahead and add an ambient occlusion uh, from height node to bring out some of the detail there. And then we're going to use those IDs that I mentioned before to randomize the color per stone. In this case, we're adding sort of a sandy color to the whole uh, the whole thing there just uh, to you know break up the texture map. We're going to use the alpha that I mentioned just so that we don't colorize the background as well. And now we're really starting to bring this to life. Again, just a handful of nodes here to do it. And I mentioned that we baked out the curvature, which is actually a really useful uh, map for adding things like uh, specular roughness. Uh, to the surface. So in this case, we're adding sort of wear on the edges of the stones. And you can see with just like this many nodes and a basic rigid body simulation, suddenly you have a very believable, realistic texture map with displacements and normals of this sort of pile of stones. Um, and so just to make sure this is tileable, which is a real focus of Houdini, all of our noises, all of our effects are tileable by default. So you get seamless texture maps. Here we're just doing a simple manipulation of the original 3D geometry, kind of moving them to the corners so that we're uh, creating sort of an easily tiled result. And you can see as we move the UVs on the right that we get a seamless texture map from that actual simulation. Um, this is just like a, a simple example of how you might do this. There's a lot of ways to create um, uh, tile maps from this, um, one of them being hex tiling. And hex tiling is something that we talked about in Houdini 20 as a, as a shading feature, um, but it also lives inside of Copernicus um, with some nice uh, extra details. So it, you're also able to align the hex tiles any way you want using, again, the direction maps that you set up. So in this case, we're kind of using the hex tiling to create this circular brick pattern and just sort of blending them all together. So this is just an example of one other way you could create these sort of seamless texture maps. Um, but since we're talking about attributes, what about UVs? So this is the same sort of walk cycle and the same attributes, but now being brought into the uh, Copernicus as a UV set. And you can see them all updating as you would expect, but now baked into that flat uh, UV space typically used for texturing. And the benefit of this means that not only can you create texture maps, but you can make them specific to the 3D geometry that they're going to end up on. And in fact, we can use the texture maps for really interesting purposes. So let's just start out here. Here's a larger network that we're just going to walk through uh, to talk about some of the possibilities here. So starting with the tile pattern, we're going to use these as sort of metal plates on our capybara, or on our flip, sorry. Then we're going to dive into SOPs and do some really basic SOP work to find the edges of those tiles, resample it, and we're going to use those to represent essentially rivets on the surface of our geometry. Now we've also baked out uh, through the rasterizer um, a gradient, which lets us actually see how things flow over the surface. And we're using those rivets to create sort of drips or streaks from each of those rivets. But they're not generically pushed in sort of a random direction. They're actually using the, the gradient of the surface to make them flow along the surface. And here's another example of just using noise. And if you look at the texture map, you can see how they don't just streak in a direction, they actually follow the surface of the geometry. And this is really important when you wanna make a, something that looks like it was made for the model, not just a generic texture. We're gonna add a little bit noise uh, and distortion to that to make it seem like it's wobbling along the surface. We're gonna combine that to, with some noise similar to the concrete example we did at the very beginning. And that's gonna sort of indicate maybe like chipped paint or something on the surface of this metal um, object that we're building. And then finally, we just colorize parts of it uh, to make it look like either the, the metal or, or the paint. Uh, and we didn't show it here, but there's also a metallicity pass just to bring out the metal underlying. And the beauty of this is that you can then plug in any object that you like to it that has UVs. And not only do you get a unique texture map for each of the uh, objects, but things like the oil streaks, the drips, the rivets, all of those things align to the actual geometry. Um, and you can also see, if you look closely, the actual UV seams themselves used as part of the texture map, where we add weld lines along where the seams meet, because we have access to not only the UV information, but the UV as, as a texture map itself. So we're able to, to take all of this information together to create sort of a unique per object texture. Now let's just take a look at some other examples that some of the artists that we worked with during development 
um, have built. I really like this sort of bubbling uh, paint texture revealing of rusty metal um, underneath. And again, applying that in a similar way to the one we just did using our uh, flip toy here. Um, but it isn't just geometry and attributes. Um, in Houdini uh, 20, we uh, introduced texture mask paint, which is a mask painter that works in, sorry? Uh, that works in SOPs for painting masks. Um, and under the, under the hood, it's essentially a 2D volume. So in this case, we're importing this 2D volume as a Copernicus layer, and then we're using that as a driver inside of a Copernicus network. So you can see that we're not just taking that mask directly and applying it, we're pulling it in and we're modifying it using some of the noises and distorts that we've already covered, and then using it to blend this material from the sort of outside sort of tile uh, look to the interior sort of wall look and it giving this nice broken up effect to let the artist paint where they want to see the results. Um, we started with a grid just for clarity here, but of course texture mask paint does work on 3D geometry. So here's just another example where we're painting on uh, the pig head and we're blending in this uh, sort of mossy texture that sort of grows inside the model. So this is another key point here is that we're not just painting a mask and just blending between two materials. We're actually looking at the depth of each material and using that to blend between them. So you can see how the moss seems to sort of grow from inside the cracks uh, until it eventually covers the surface. And again, it opens up a lot of possibilities for uh, fully procedural texturing with this artist-driven approach to customize it specifically for uh, whatever geometry they happen to be um, using. Um, and that applies to height fields um, as well. So. Uh, height fields have had various color options and outputs uh, since they were uh, brought into Houdini. Um, but now we can take those height fields and all the sort of information that height fields produce, like flow maps, uh, water, erosion, so on, and use all that information to modify, uh, it, to modify it inside of Copernicus and generate uh, terrain texture maps. So here it is back applied to our height field. And of course, this information flows through live through the network, so I can adjust my height field. And as I do that, you can see things like uh, the water, the erosion, and so on, all being sort of picked up from the erosion simulation, fed into Copernicus, and then back out into our network. So you can see a fully procedural terrain and texturing generation all in one go. And this will sort of update live as you're working. So you can even sort of preview animations uh, in the viewport. So in this case, we're doing sort of maybe a more simple kind of effect of this fire um, spreading over the surface of this uh, torus. But really what we're just showing here is that you can preview animation. This is kind of a more of a maybe a game side of effect where we're using basically scrolling UVs and various noises to create this sort of fiery effect and then previewing it on the geometry. So it's possible to really build something and see the result very quickly, um, even if you're going to be exporting this maybe to a game engine as a sprite sheet or something along those lines. So now let's just take a look at some examples that were made over the course of development by um, uh, artists internally and externally that we worked with to test out Pernicus. I really love this sort of clay plate example, which has a ton of detail. Um, again, using all the, the nodes that we talked about noise, distort, SDF shapes to build this very complex pattern. And you can see in the upper right corner there, the sort of inspiration that was used. So we're able to really get very far along the line to reproducing real world textures using Copernicus at this point. Here's another really nice example of this uh, vase, again, trying to mimic a real world um, example on the upper right there. Um, but also just a bunch of different examples that were used over development just to show just the range of things that can be created. Um, some of these use the simulation that I showed before, and you'll see this in a second, a little sort of uh, puffy, uh, uh, sort of quilted example, which uses the planar inflate that I showed earlier as well. So again, all these tools speaking to each other, generating a wide variety of texture types. Um, and then of course, the ability to render them all nicely using that same preview material here on this case, uh, creating the, the petal texture on this animated um, flower. Um, 
So, uh, you know, we keep sort of downplaying compositing because we just want to be clear that, you know, we're not really um, a full suite of tools. Um, however, there are about 150 nodes inside of Copernicus already. So it is a very full featured image editing uh, suite. Um, but here we're going to talk about sort of more traditional compositing. So first of all, I do want to point out that you're seeing sort of a 3D track here. That is not done in Copernicus. That's done using a, a third party um, camera tracking software. So I just want to make sure that's very clear here. Um, uh, everything else, however, is Copernicus. So let's look at how we took this character and did some basic some positing to put it into this scene. So here's the render network. You can see we've brought in our undistorted plate. You can see that sort of barrel distortion where that we've removed so that we can apply our 3D geometry uh, to it nicely. Uh, we're going to bring in our geometry here just using a scene import and some lights. Um, and you can see using the background plate, we project the background plate basically onto that geometry so that we can get nice reflections and shadow maps and all the holdouts you would sort of expect from a standard visual effects workflow. And then we just bake that out to disk. So here now in Copernicus, let's bring in the result of that. So we're going to bring in this EXR sequence. And we're going to click this AOV from file button. And you see now we get all of our passes. Some of them are a little hard to see here, but there are shadow masks, reflection masks, holdouts. Again, all the standard sort of visual effects passes you would expect from something like this. And all this network is really going to do is take our, um, take all of our masks and holdouts, and they're just going to bring them all together to create, you know, a typical sort of 3D object into a photographic plate setup. Uh, there are a couple of nuances that are important to do here. So we're bringing in our background plate, uh, but you can see this is the un undistorted one, uh, the original plate before we remove the distortion. So we do need to use some tools um, to make sure things line up because our footage was rendered on this undistorted background, and now we kind of need to re-distort it. And to do that, we're going to use the tool that I already showed you from Copernicus earlier, which is the UV sample node. So this UV map was generated by that 3D tracking software that I mentioned, which represents the amount of distortion. We'll use the UV sample node to do that, uh, to undistort our footage or redistort it, depending on how you look at it. And now everything lines up and matches up. So again, all this uh, is really just to demonstrate that, you know, the fundamental tools of a compositor are here. Uh, they work. Um, but, you know, don't expect to do intense compositing work using uh, the out-of-the-box nodes in Copernicus. So let's just finish up here. We're going to combine all this stuff together, and then we can uh, just finalize our basic setup, bring all of our elements together, our various distorts, undistorts, and so on, until finally we get to this uh, basic uh, composite network. And we can jump around the timeline and see how everything lines up. And it looks pretty good. Okay, so awesome. We've done a basic, uh, we've proved to you that we could do basic compositing. But wouldn't it be really nice if for this basic workflow, some people will call this slap comp, which is to say, you know, you have your basic rendering layers. You want to have a little network to just make sure, verify essentially that everything works the way you sort of expect it to work. But it's this post-process. We had to we wrote it all to disk, then we read it all back in, and we built the network, and then maybe we write out the sequence. Well, what if instead I could actually do this all live while I'm rendering? You know, why what if I could run that compositing network as I'm rendering instead of afterwards? So we have something called a slap comp block. Uh, and what this allows us to do is take that exact compositing network. I'm just going to rewire it into the slap comp. And instead of pulling images from disk, it's going to pull them from the render as it's rendering. So now I can take this basic um, slap comp setup where we've combined our mask and undistorted the footage and done all of the standard things you would do in a visual effects workflow. And now back rendering uh, in the viewport, I can simply uh, go ahead and enable slap comp by turning on this toggle in the viewport. And you can see it's undistorted our plate. And it's done all the compositing work that we just walked through, but now it happens as you're rendering it instead of as, as a post process. So now this opens up a lot of possibilities, especially for previewing things as you're working. Maybe maybe a, a compositing T has set up this slap comp network for you, and you're just going to run it in the background as you're doing their lighting. And you can see that it is live. I've added a glow now to this scene just to glow the windows. And as I modify the compositing, 
Copernicus network, it updates in my viewport as I'm rendering. So this is really powerful because this isn't just like one single type of filter. This is anything you can build inside of the Copernicus network. Um, but we can take it uh, even further than that. So, okay, let's say you're happy with this and you think it, it looks good and maybe you want to send something off for approvals. Typically, again, you would write this all out to disk. Maybe you have some sort of a script that grabs that and runs it through a compositing network. Well, instead, using our new slap comp output driver here on the USD render op, we can actually just directly do that. So bypass that whole system, say run this compositing network on my render as I'm outputting it to disk all in one pass, which I think is a really um, amazing sort of time saver. And it really takes that, um, that loop and makes it as tight as possible. We're sort of shrinking that time between previewing an effect, compositing the effect, rendering the effect, and sort of pushing them all together as close as we can. And of course, this is mostly, as I said, very preliminary stuff. This is going to be sent downstream to a compositor who's going to do, you know, the real work. Um, but still, this gives you a lot of potential. And you can imagine in the future, as our compositing tools spread out uh, further and further and offer more uh, opportunities, we can get things uh, doing more and more interesting results. And here now, just playing the result with the glow and everything that we added in that um, simple compositing network. Um, now, despite all that complexity and, and possibility, um, it also can be very simple. Like, you know, maybe I just want to add a little bit of a glow to my render. Well, I can go ahead and maybe add a filter the, to, my, to my render as I'm working. It doesn't have to be a complex slap comp setup. In fact, we can use that UI to jump to the network and see, you know, just a handful of nodes modifying my render as I'm working on it, which could then be written out to, to disk directly, sort of a, a render filter, if you want to think of it that way. So this opens up a ton of possibilities because a lot of times you're like, you know what, I just need a little glow on this, just something to, to jazz up my render a little bit. Maybe rendered out a pyro explosion, you know, and it's just like, oh, it looks a little better if there was a little glow or a little chromatic aberration or something. And you can do that using these um, viewport filters. And you can see that it is interactive. As we move around the viewport, it updates as you're rendering it. So this is opening up a ton of possibilities of sort of merging look development, lighting, and compositing all into sort of one place that the artist can take advantage of. So we are also OpenFX compatible. So we will load OpenFX tools into Houdini and they will show up as you would expect inside of Houdini as almost native tools. So this is really great. This is a great way if you have a suite of tools. So for instance, there's this suite of tools called the Sapphire suite of tools, which use OpenFX. Um, it's by Boris Effects. It does require a license, but if you have access to these OpenFX tools, they will show up in Copernicus. You'll be able to run them directly already. Um, and so you can see here a large number of nodes that already exist in this suite of tools. They're great tools. Um, so if you do have access to those tools, you can start compositing in Copernicus basically right now. So this is an excellent way to sort of fill in some of the missing pieces of our uh, compositor um, as it exists today. And it is sort of a seamless integration. So here's just a quick example of dropping down um, this uh, Sapphire node here. You can see it on the right, which brings in these sort of god rays. Um, but we're going to combine it with a remap node which is one of the nodes you saw us use earlier, which is one of our standard nodes. So these are able to communicate and pass data between them um, seamlessly. And that means you can build larger, more complex networks. So in this case, we're, again, we're using that Sapphire suite of tools to add a glow. We're going to add some god rays. But if you look down the lower left corner, we are using um, uh, Cryptomat to isolate some of these uh, items uh, and, and map them out, essentially. And the Cryptomat nodes you're seeing down there are native nodes. So again, all this stuff is working together, our native nodes and the open effects nodes, which really opens up the possibilities for the compositor now, but also into the future. You know, and you get this, this nice result out of the other end. And uh, just as a side note, all the texturing that you're seeing here was done using Copernicus. So you can see that uh, some of the vases and texture maps that we talked about earlier um, on all of the items in this um, scene. So there's a lot of interesting ways all these things can then come together. The 3D geometry, the texture mapping, the compositing. So in this case, we have this sort of character that you saw in the short earlier, um, sweating, and then these streaks of sweat left behind um, on the mesh as a wet map. 
So in this case, we're taking a, a basic sort of particle simulation that has been converted into a VDBs, and we're going to grab that information. We're going to sample it into uh, UV space, and then we're going to do some basic compositing things to like blur and dilate it to modify that and get a animated texture map out of the other side that can then be applied to this character. So you can see the actual character itself is very sort of low res. The geometry is very simple. So you would need some sort of uh, wet map kind of effect to do this. And it all combines uh, together. And here's just another quick example of, of doing that. So we're pulling in this uh, particle simulation. And you can see that we've just baked in some attributes, in this case, basically a, a UV map onto there. Um, and then we're going to sample those points and sort of basically create an association between the points in the particle simulation and the pixels in this portrait of Mr. Copernicus himself, um, and then modify it over time. And if you look closely, uh, you would see that there was an OpenCL node in there that did that map. And so again, we've already said that OpenCL is sort of the basis of Copernicus, but you can also use OpenCL snippets to write your own nodes immediately. If you're familiar with Wrangles, this is very similar to that. We've simplified the OpenCL uh, snippet uh, approach so that artists can work with this in a way that's closer to working with VEX wrangles. It's not exactly the same, but it's it's along those uh, that road. And so obviously we provide OpenCL on all our nodes, but now you can also write your own and create your own filters. Uh, and speaking of, of filters and effects like that and making your own, here we have the Onyx inference node, again, now a Copernicus version of it. And what you're seeing here is some basic style uh, transfer, which uh, ship with Onyx. So these are not our examples. These are examples that ship with the uh, Onyx engine. But you can see taking the original footage and making this sort of stylized effect. This is really just laying the groundwork for taking those tools that we've already talked about for doing training um, and creating associations between samples and being able to build your own ML-based filters and run them inside of Pernicus. So generate information, use that to train your model, and then implement the model in Copernicus and run it. So we're trying to create this holistic pipeline where you can generate and train models and then use the models directly inside the same context. So most of what we've sort of shown here so far has been, you know, your traditional sort of compositing stuff or texture synthesis and sort of a focus on semi-realistic results. But uh, this example um, is really nice because it's obviously not photorealistic at all, um, but it's still really interesting. You can see some, uh, some really nice animation, first of all, but also um, the edges of these sort of cubes, this sort of uh, fractal cube animation. It's a really cool result. And that's all done through Pernicus manipulating standard sort of render passes. So some of that is using um, your your typical sort of edge detection algorithms that you would expect, um, as well as some custom ones that we've built for detecting edges using a, a bunch of different uh, algorithms, in this case, by depth, by normal, by contour. And pulling all those out lets you pull out different amounts of information, either information uh, that's just natively on there, like the normals or the depth, or to use contour-based IDs, which means that you can build AOVs yourself to say like, oh, I want a line around this part no matter what. I don't care what angle I'm looking at it on. I want to make sure there's a line. So you have a lot of flexibility. And in this case, we're creating sort of a graphic novel kind of look for Crag there on the, light, on the left by combining these. We also have a Kuhara filter and lots of ways to manipulate your images. So here's some examples that were just built up over time uh, as we were developing uh, Copernicus have sort of a tune shaded effect at the top left. Um, this really interesting hatching effect, which uses edge detection, um, the slope direction that we talked about, and uh, hex tiling to bring these hatching textures all together, um, along with some special AOVs to, to bring it all together. Um, and stamp points in the upper right, creating this sort of screen, uh, screen print kind of effect. So there's a lot of possibilities for what we're doing here. Here's just another example of Craig being distorted in this interesting way to create something that has nothing to do with uh, photorealism. Um, of course, it's not just uh, meshes. It's uh, volumes or really anything that you can render. So we're going to do some manipulation to this to, to take our standard sort of pyro simulation 
um, and turn it into something maybe a little bit more interesting, sort of a cartoon version of a pyro effect. And you can see here an example of a bunch of different styles applied uh, to that. Um, I really like the upper right, which has this sort of graphic design, 90s style uh, sort of scribble effect over the top. But again, all very interesting, very far away from what the input is paired to the output. So all this means that you can take, you know, anything that you need to generate an interesting look, build it into the AOV outputs, bring them into Copernicus, and create something that doesn't have very much uh, to do with the original render at all. So here we have these two characters. You can see lighting, shadows, sort of tune shading, edge detection, the contour-based outlines. And this is the uh, the network that builds it. So um, obviously it's a, it's a bit of a larger network compared to some of the others that we've seen, but you can see that at the top left there, the modify lighting for tune shading, each of those streams is basically each light uh, coming in. The adjust textures just takes the original texture map, some of the stuff, the detail on the on the coat and the various colors, which were rendered out in such a way that the texture maps do not affect the lighting. They're actually fully separate. Then we adjust the shadows just to, um, you know, tune them to look right with the flat shading of everything else. Uh, we modify the torch lighting, which is also taking that pyro effect now and rendering it so that we can flatten it and make it feel like it merges better with the overall tune shading. You can see that gray box filling in the outlines. Um, and the final blue box there at the end is just really combining all of those layers together and doing some final color correction on the overall look. So lots and lots of possibilities here. The original render in the upper left-hand corner, um, and then the stylized result uh, in the main body. And this, is, I think, is a really interesting example where there's sort of more stylization on the fire than, it, than there is on the, the rest of the scene. So you're able to really tweak specific parts of your image for different looks. Um, here's the hatching example again, which is also looking really nice and really interesting, almost like a hand animated result. And then just sort of as an experiment, we created this large scale simulation for our launch for Houdini 20. Um, and here we've taken that, that result and sort of made this interesting new, completely new look for that using, uh, some of the techniques that we just, uh, talked about. And just to end off here, the same thing now brought in with this sort of catching style, some of the edge detection. And you can see we get these really cool, really interesting results that really only can come together as this post effect that we've created. So um, this is Project Copernicus sort of come to life. Um, I hope uh, you've enjoyed the presentation. I'm going to wrap up my part here. and I'm going to invite uh, Rob back to the stage to end off the proceedings. But uh, thank you very much. Nice work. Okay, wow, thank you. Thank you, Scott. Um, what do you guys think? A lot of stuff in 20.5, huh? Yeah, okay, just a little bit. Um, and we didn't even get to everything. Um, there's lots of things, uh, you know, guide curves in quad remesher, which are still, quad remesher is still in beta, um, but we're constantly trying to improve that. Uh, better um, detangling with feathers or de-intersection, I should say. Uh, blue noise and karma. I mean, there's those are just a few examples of some of the stuff that we didn't get to show you today. We wish we could have. We cannot. Um, so all of this will be available to the world in a month, in July. Um, so with that, uh, I want to thank everyone that uh, contributed to Houdini 20.5, not just, you know, everybody in R&D that has made this amazing piece of software, everybody that contributed their art, uh, everything you saw here today, some internal, some external, some of you are here tonight with us that contributed to the launch presentation. Um, everyone in marketing that made today happen. In particular, I wanna thank uh, Bruno Abe, who really helped um, help Paula and Charlotte today. Without him, this couldn't have happened. So thank you, Bruno. Um, and of course, all of our alpha and beta testers who have given us such valuable feedback and really helped us shape what you see and always push us to do better and better and give you such a great product. Um, so now with that, I will leave you with a very long list of what you didn't get to see today. Thank you.
んですよ。